Okay. All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome. I'm going to get started. Um, welcome, everyone, to um, our pre conference session. Um, just a little housekeeping uh, to get us started. Please, um, please connect to audio using your computer. You will all be muted during the presentation, but if you have questions for the speaker, please use the Q&A, which you can see at the bottom of your screen on the bottom right. Um, the chat box is also open, so please, if you um, have comments, um, just to, to mention, you can use the chat box, but if you have a question that you want us to pass on to the speaker, we will please put that in the Q&A. That'll be easier for us to, to manage. We'll take most questions um, at the end, unless it's a clarifying question about what um, Tracy's presenting at the moment. Um, if you have technical difficulties, um, please use the, uh, the email conference at ihaforhealth.org um, and someone will get right back to you and help you fix your, your technical issues. Uh, this will be recorded um, and posted on the conference website on May 19th. So there is a recording, you will get the slides. Um, and um, so don't worry about that. Um, also, if you're requesting continuing education credits, you have to submit two evaluations. One is a session evaluation, which we will email to you probably by the end of the week. That's about this session. And then two, you need to fill out a, um, an overall conference evaluation, um, which will come at the end of the conference um, in, in later in May. So both of those uh, evaluations will get you your CE credits. Um, and again, if you have any questions, you can ask that conference at ihahealth.org for assistance. Um, so, uh, I would like to now, uh, with great pleasure, introduce Tracy Meehan. She is going to be talking about visual dissemination, how to create visuals to help get your research findings out to the public using free or low-cost tools. Tracy's from Children's Hospital Nationwide. Um, she's the Director of Research Translation and Communications for the Center for Injury Research and Policy. Uh, she takes research out of the journal and into the public. Tracy focuses on the effective communication of injury prevention messages and helping others translate their research for non-scientific audiences. In addition, she often serves as an expert for mainstream media. In her free time, she is pursuing a PhD in public health at The Ohio State University. Um, so we're very pleased to have you, Tracy. Uh, we really look forward to your presentation and I will let you take it away. Great, thanks Julie, and thanks to IHA for inviting me to speak today, I'm really excited. I have a lot to share, so I'm gonna jump right in. So as Julie mentioned, I'm gonna be talking about visual dissemination today, and I, I know we already showed the title, but I just wanted to point out that this um, icon up here at the top is something that I created completely from scratch using tools that we're gonna to share today. So we'll, we'll see that later, but I wanted to point that out. Okay, I also wanted to show this. Um, I do want this to be interactive. So if you have resources you wanna share or comments about things that are happening, definitely type that in the chat. And as Julie mentioned, if you have questions, make sure you type that in the Q&A. And also notice this image because we're gonna come back to the image later as well. Okay, so some details for my presentation. Um, as Julie mentioned, the files will be available. Um, I'm gonna have a pre the presentation available and also a resource list because I share a lot of resources in here. So those will be uploaded to the conference website. So you will be able to get those. Um, and you will notice in the presentation, there are some um, hyperlinks you can see that have the text underlined. And sometimes I just type out the URL. So all of that will be available to you. Um, I'm also trying something new with this presentation. This is the screenshot icon. And so there are a few places where you might wanna use the information before the conference. So if you see this little icon in the corner, I would encourage you to either take a screenshot of that um, slide or take out your phone and take a picture. And as you, um, this will be one of them. As you can see at the bottom, I have the two um, tags for my organization as well as my personal tag. If you're gonna um, mention any of this on social media, which we would love, um, please use those um, and the hashtag at the bottom for the conference. So the conference people um, know that you're tweeting about it. So I would, or posting on Instagram or wherever you post. So I would appreciate that. 
Um, okay. And then just one last little tip that I've learned with virtual conferences, uh, for those of you that are lucky enough to have two screens or a big enough monitor, sometimes what I'll do is actually open up a Google Doc during a presentation so that I have it right next to the presentation. So you can type notes right into a Google Doc. And then while you're watching the presentation, then you have access to all of it right there. So it's a fun little trick that I've learned that I thought I'd share because not everybody knows about that. Okay, so jumping in. Um, this is a map that John Snow created in 1854 during a cholera, out, cholera outbreak in London. And it was one of the first examples of a visual representation of data. And so he, he was trying to figure out, at the time they believed that cholera was a miasma in the air. And he was trying to prove that there was something else going on because if it was a miasma, then everybody in London would get it, but only certain people were getting it. So it's a, it was one of the first examples of how powerful visual data can be to help people understand a problem. If you can see the little marks, these are all people that got it. And you can see how many are right next to this pump. And it was his way of being able to show in a visual format, people who couldn't understand what he was talking about. And so visuals really do have power to help explain. So that's one example, but I wanted to give some more of why vi visual dissemination matters. 80% um, of internet users have looked online for health information. So they're going there. We want to be there. Visual dissemination can also help make complex information easier to understand for some if done well. So again, any way we can help people understand our information, we need to be there. It can help reinforce written or spoken messages. It can help combat misinformation, which we all know is everywhere these days. It attracts attention. If you're posting on social media, for instance, it posts with visuals are much more likely to attract attention. And one thing that I've added recently is it can start to change the social norms. And especially given everything that's happening in our country right now, I can't do many things by myself, but one thing I can do is change the way I put visual information out there and change social norms about who is in our environment and how we're representing them. And, and I really believe that we can do that through how through the visuals that we choose to put out into the public. And I'll show some examples of that. This is, this is one. So we did a campaign on stair injuries and you know, stair injuries happen to everybody across the spectrum um, for, among young children. And we made a purposeful effort to think about who we were choosing to display. One of the tools I'm gonna to show um, later is called Canva. And I love it because it allows me to not be limited by what photos are available to me, but I can add different representations and different people. I can help represent what the population I'm trying to reach, what their lived experiences are if I'm working with a, a specific population. And it's really easy to create images with text that can be translated into a variety of languages. And then I'm not just translating text and, and putting it on a picture that might not fit with that population. I can change the population and it's really easy to do that. And um, I think it's a great way to expand who we're talking to. Um, I also think it's really important, as I mentioned, to show diversity of all kinds. Um, stock sites, photo stock sites are still kind of catching up with us a little bit, but the images are out there. And so I challenge you to start including them whenever you can. When you do a presentation and you're looking for a photo of a family, you can just as easily put different kinds of families um, than just the typical white family, which we see a lot, um, white straight family. And so it can, by just putting it out there and not calling attention to the fact that you're doing that, but making it part of the norm, I think we can start to shift the way we're talking and, and who is accepted. You, we can also use visuals to address accessibility. Um, and so I wanna talk just for a minute here about alt text and designing for accessibility. I'm gonna show a Twitter image and a PowerPoint design. So this is an example of, I posted that I was going to be presenting and in the Twitter handle, when I posted this image, there's a little option when you post the image, it, call, it says add description, as you can see here. 
And what pops up when you hit that is this little box and it says edit photo so you can crop here, but there's also this box alt, which until you know the within the past year, I didn't really know what that was, but I started to, to do some more research. And what that is, is it allows you to add this description down here so that people who have visual challenges and need to use screen readers or, or audio readers can, can tell what it is. If they can't see it, you write the words in so that you can give them a description so that they can interact with your presentation in the same way as people who have no challenges with visuals. You can also do this in PowerPoint, which I think is great. And so here, if you, you have to go up to the top here, so where it's PowerPoint tools, check accessibility. When you hit that, it will run an analysis that will tell you where you need to add alt text and where titles and where um, text is missing. Then it, by adding that in, you can make your presentations more accessible to a wider population. So I would encourage everyone to start changing the way they um, create their presentations to start including some of this information. <clears throat> I also want us to think about where we're gonna use the visuals because where we're using them matters, but it also um, is important to think about where our audience is. So if I'm trying to reach uh, the general public, <laughs> posters and presentations, they're not gonna see that stuff. They might not see something in a journal, but they might see a video or they might see something on social media or the media or an infographic. There's lots of different ways that we can do that. And I challenge you to think about all the different ways that you can get your information out visually um, and thinking about where your audience is and go to them where they are. So just before we jump into the actual examples, um, just a little reminder that it's important to remember that you're not just doing research or running a program, but that you're telling a story that helps people understand why this information is relevant to them. And that's really important, why it's relevant to them. Help them feel like this matters to them in their life, and they will become more engaged with what it is you're trying to share with them. Okay, so now I'm going to show a couple examples. So these are all things that we created for various um, outreach efforts. So this is an example um, for one of the programs I work with. It's actually a Zoom background. And so we use that at a conference where we were trying to make connections with people. And because I had this Zoom background, it had my name on it and it had a way to get to our organization. It was behind me the entire time. Just like you see, oops, IHA here, you see that information. It's great to have that when you're going to conferences or things like that where people might see your, your background and then it's a quick way to be able to connect with you. Um, so these two are examples of how we translated some of our research. So sometimes people get really caught up in the details and the statistics and that's great, but sometimes the best and easiest way to connect with audiences is a quote. And so we, it's simple. You can make, you can do this in PowerPoint, you can do this in Canva, and you just create a quote that helps them connect with your research and why it matters. So this one was just plain background. This one had a little bit more information um, and they all are shared on our social media. This is a great one from Nationwide Children's Hospital that they actually have this posted not only on social media, but we have um, electronic digital boards around the hospital. And this, these, this pops up. So if you're standing in line waiting to order food, you might, you might see this and it gets the message out. Um, so th there's fun ways that you can do that. And it's pretty simple to create. This is an example of a GIF that we created that is on our social media as well. Um, and it's um, pretty simple to create and it just cycles through just a few messages that have very simple language that help people understand what you can do to make writing on an ATV a, a little safer. Um, so those are just a couple examples. And then this is just an infographic we created. Um, so these are some examples that we created for a Twitter chat where we were trying to get information out about creating, uh, about button batteries and how dangerous they can be. And so we created a hashtag so it's easy to follow. And I want to point out it's not all in capitals. It's button with a capital B, up, capital U, batteries. And part of the reason we wrote it in that specific way, it's more accessible. It makes it easier for people that have 
um, either visual challenges or where English is not their first language to be able to understand it when you make the words separate and more clear. We also try to make it an action that we wanted you to do something, button up your batteries or put them and store them safely because they can be dangerous. Um, so I'm just gonna kind of go through these pretty quickly, but these are some visuals that we created to go along with this campaign that we created using a program called Canva, which I'm gonna show in a little bit, but kind of simple messages, Not we try not to get too many on one page. Um, and then we also had a Twitter chat that went along with it. Um, and along with the not putting two messages in one area, in public health, we like to tell you everything we know about a topic all at one time, because we want to make sure you have all of the information. And sometimes that can be overwhelming to people. So this was an example uh, we had from a paper we did on amusement ride related injuries. And I asked my team to put together some tips for parents on how they could prevent amusement ride injuries. And they came up with five pages of tips, which is great and a lot of information, but no parents ever going to remember that. So we looked at all of the different recommendations and we looked at data on how families were getting injured and we narrowed it down to the top five and we created this graphic and we tried to make it pretty simple to follow. So, um, you know, things like know your child. If you don't think he or she will be able to uh, follow the rules, keep her, him or her off the ride, trust your instincts. If you're worried about the safety of the ride, choose a different activity. These are all things that parents can control and have, can take an action and it's, they're easy to remember. So thinking about that when you create your messaging. Uh, okay, so now we're gonna go into visual abstracts. So visual abstracts have be become a little more common recently as a way to translate a complicated research article into one visual that is a little more easy to understand. And while I've seen it primarily with research, I can also see this happening with programs to talk about what your program is and why somebody would wanna participate, things like that. Most of the time these are shown either in presentations or on social media. This particular study is showing how uh, if you use the visual abstract to talk about your research, it, uh, which gave it a visual then, the impression that it had 7.7 .7 times more impressions, more retweets, and more article visits. So you can see it really does make a difference when you have a visual that goes along with it. How to create a visual abstract. I am not going to go into that. There is an awesome presentation, which I have linked here, which you will have access to that literally walks you through step by step how to do this using PowerPoint and University of Michigan put this together and they did a really nice job and it is really they make it so that really anybody can do it. So the hardest part is figuring out what data to put on there. But I definitely encourage you to take a look because they do a fantastic job putting this together. Uh, hey, can I just right. ask a quick question? Sure. Sorry. Someone just wants to know if um, PDFs are ADA accessible um, and uh, are Canva publications easy to make this way? You might be covering that later, but while you're on Canva, just wanted to put that out. Um, you know what? I actually don't know the answer to that question. So I will look into that, Natalie, and um, make sure I get back to you. That's a great question. Um, okay. So, um, these are some examples of visual abstracts. Uh, the ones on the left are ones that CDC did. I put two of them in there because I, I just like the visuals that they used and the fact that they actually used a, a, a photo in the middle of this one. And you can see big text, not a lot in there, but still gives you some good information. This one at the top right is one that we created. I'm gonna actually show you how we created that. Um, and then one from Michigan, because they're just, they're doing a lot of them. And if you're looking for examples, I would encourage you to take a look um, to see what's out there. And then I just thought I would show, this one is just from the other day, April 1st, and it actually shows um, Cochrane, um, what an example of how they, what it looks like to use it on social media. Okay. Um, this is an example of how we went through creating a visual abstract. So we had a paper on ATV injuries and we wrote a press release on it and we knew we wanted to do some social media around it. So we had notes from our press release of all different kinds of data. So this is kind of how it started. And then this was a first draft that we put together and you can see it has 
the um, very scientific title on here. It has some, some data to share. Um, we're gonna put the actual citation logos on there, maybe doesn't look exactly great. And we're fiddling with what data is gonna look the best here. Um, the other thing that, so we, where we started, we talked about kind of bad things that adolescent ATV, ATV riders were doing and how these are the bad things that are happening and how you can reduce those behaviors. Um, and then we, we said, you know, that the data that we put on there maybe is not the most compelling. So we changed some of the data a little bit um, on the left-hand side. We changed the title to make it a little more friendly. So it, it's not so quite so sciencey. And then on the right side, we flipped it. And instead of focusing on what the negative was happening, we changed it to the positive of, to avoid injury, here's some things that um, children and teens can do to, to avoid injury instead of talking about what other kids are doing that's bad. And then we ended up with this version that it has the citation you can see. We made the, the data in the middle, uh, something that was a little more simple, made the data on the right show all of the correct behaviors. Um, even right here, you can see before we had said, um, you know, limit to two passengers, but that, that's not the right thing. We wanted to show an image of only one passenger because that's the correct behavior. Still don't love that we use prohibit, but um, you know, we tried to make it a little more simple and a little more understandable. And then the logo matched our logo a little better, but that's a, just a quick example of, our process through so you can see how we went through. Um, okay, so I want to talk a little bit about photos because if you're creating visuals, in many cases you will need to use photos, but there are some things you need to look out for when doing that. Um, first, they can be expensive. And so I put this um, as a great resource. These are all different resources. Again, you, will, you can click on those when you actually get the document and be able to see where they are, but you can also search for them. And you'll notice this is one of our, my screenshot pages. So if you want this ahead of time, I would encourage you to take a screenshot or a picture of this page. And these are all ones that have at least some images available for free for you to use. Um, but a lot of people I see when they put presentations together, they just go out and they Google whatever image they want, like interactive, which is the image that I pointed out at the very beginning of this presentation. And um, that's not good because you may not actually technically be allowed to use that photo. Again, I'm not gonna go through this whole thing. So you might wanna screenshot this page as well, but I strongly encourage you to have this as a resource that's like readily available when you're thinking about using a picture, knowing whether or not you actually have the rights to use that picture. And this is a great way to go through it. Um, a couple of things that you will want to look out for when you're looking for photos, you want to look for, does this, this C at the top here means copyright, which means you, you can't use that without permission. This is the fair use symbol, which means you can if it's used for certain purposes. <laughs> um, Creative Commons here is another type of license and they are copyrighted, but the person who created it has given certain licenses that you are allowed to use it in certain ways. And then this last one is public domain, which means if it ever had a copyright on it, the copyright is passed and you are allowed to use it. Again, not going to go through these a lot, but these are just some examples of Creative Commons license. And so you can see some different ones. Like this means you, you can use it, but you just have, you have to give attribution. So you have to say this work was created by whoever. Um, some of them will say you can use it, but only it for non-commercial purposes, or you can use it, but you can't change it. So just make sure you're aware that those exist and what to do about it. Um, for the ones that have require attribution, here's an example of what it would look like if I use this particular photo. Uh, I put in here what the name of the photo was, who the author was, how it was licensed, and these are actually links, so they can link to that if they wanna find more. 
And then the last thing, sometimes we have an image, but we don't know where it came from and we don't know if we're allowed to use it. And so there's this great resource called Tin Eye. There's other ones out there. This is the one I'm most familiar with. And it's actually a reverse image search. So if you have the image on your computer, you can actually upload it right here. And I'm gonna show you what that looks like. So I uploaded this picture of this little boy on a bike and it showed me that there are 40 different results. So across the website, they found really quickly 40 different images of the bat being used. And the first one you can see is iStock, which means you cannot use that unless you buy it from iStock. So that's really important to know. And it's, it's very quick. Um, and then this just, if you go to iStock, this is what it costs to buy the image. And you can do that, but you just need to know that you need to. Okay, and so this is an example. I told you earlier, I wanted you to look at that interaction slide um, picture. And so this is how that came to be, how I came to use that one. So I wanted to have something, I wanted to have an image to talk about interaction. And so I went to Google, like a lot of people do, and I typed in interaction and I ser searched the images here. And so this first picture came up and I was like, oh, I love that picture. Let me see if I can use that. So I went to Tenai. And I realized, nope, it's a stock photo, so I can use it. But if I use it, then I have to pay for it. And I didn't have a budget for that. So um, I, I went to some of the other places to find it, but realized I was going to have to pay. And this is how much I was going to pay. Now, in this case, it's not hugely expensive, but I would have had spent $29. So I decided I didn't want to do that. So I went back to Google and I limited the search type to Creative Commons licenses. So those are ones I might actually be able to use with attribution. And this is what came up and nothing there kind of really got me. So I went to some of the websites that I showed earlier, the photo sites, and this, these are the types of images that were coming up when I was looking for interaction. And again, not really what I was looking for. So I had to do a little bit of searching. Uh, then I went to Canva and because I have a, um, membership with Canva, I am allowed to use these photos. So I found it on Canva and that's the one I want and that's what I went with. So just taking you through the process. I also wanted to show some modeling of the right behavior. One of the things that we find is um, at my institution, the one on the left here, the water safety drowning, that came as we wrote a, a blog post on drowning prevention among children and right Right at the beginning of the, of the blog post, we talk about how it's we don't recommend using floaties because those are really toys. They're not intended to save lives and we don't recommend using them. And we submitted our article to the blog post and they had just hired a new person to work and that person didn't know our process and didn't know um, a lot about injury prevention. And she found this great photo with floaties showing the exact thing we said not to do. There are kids in the pool, no parents around and they're using floaties. So I had to go back to them and say, you know what? We actually like to show the right behavior because there is research out there that shows if the image says shows one thing and the text shows something else, it can be very confusing. And people sometimes remember the photo over the text. So we don't want them to remember that. In this case, it's always better to match the photo with the image and show the correct right behavior. And so that, that happens, um, it can happen. Um, this is one where the, the article was actually about keeping kids safe from burns. So it wasn't related to high chairs at all, but we recommend that if children are in high chairs that they're strapped in so they can't climb out. So even though it's not related to what we were talking about, it's still showing an unsafe behavior. So we really try and make sure at our institution, we're not doing that. We try and always show the right behavior. And then this last one is a great example. We did a study on laundry detergent packets and we showed um, that that children under six can be really seri seriously burned um, if they swallow them or squish them and it goes onto their face. So we recommend that families don't use them. And we worked with this great uh, video production company who put all this um, you know, great pieces together talking to our researchers and all of that kind of stuff. And then they wanted to get what's called B-roll, which is that the image that's showing in the background when an anchor is talking, you know, next up a study on laundry detergent packets. And 
they got this B-roll without us there. And because they're video people, they wanted to show striking visuals. And so they dumped the laundry detergent packets out into this pretty little bowl here so everybody could see what they were. When our recommendation is not, not only don't use them if they have children under six, but if you are gonna have them in the home, make sure they're locked up in a cabinet stored away from where children can reach, not in a pretty thing that looks like a candy dish. So we had to go back and talk to them about, okay, this is why we don't do that. Um, and so I, it's a learning experience for all of us and they're all different pieces. We thought we had everything covered, but those are some examples from our own institution. So somebody I, I'm noticing here recommend, do I recommend purchasing a premium account with Canva? So I would definitely say yes, if you can afford it. Um, I, I will also say though, if you are a nonprofit, if you go through their services, they actually offer the premium account to nonprofits for free. If you submit the right documentation to prove that you're a nonprofit, which I highly recommend. We were able to do that. And the extra services that you get are can be worth it if you have it in your budget. If you don't, you can still use it for free and it's great. Um, okay, so speaking of Canva, here we go. I'm going to be brave and I'm gonna do a little demonstration. Bear with me here for a second where I pull, while I pull this up. Okay, I'm going to go through Canva. And Tracy, sorry yeah. to interrupt. Um, as you go through camera, Canva, sorry, someone um, wants to hear your recommendations on whether the free version seems to be enough or what you get with the premium. So just, uh, you know, as, as you go through it, keep that in mind. Sure. Thanks. Okay, so this is an example of our, this now this is a premium account. This is our account. Um, and one of the things I love about Canva is it has templates for almost anything you could want and it recommends it. So you can do a presentation, you can do social media posts, you can create a logo, a flyer. We've done um, the, the threefold brochures, uh, the pop-up um, presentations that you take on tables back when we were allowed to see people in person. Um, there's, there's all kinds of things you can do on here. Um, Zoom virtual backgrounds is a great one and I'm actually gonna show a little bit of that. Um, so you can do a ton of things. And one thing that I love is um, Twitter. For example, if you type in Twitter, it sizes them differently based on what you need and it automatically sizes it the right way. So here's an example of where free versus premium. You can get this automatically. It'll do Twitter posts, header, all of that for free. A lot of times what we like to do for some of our campaigns is we provide things from Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. The free version, you have to go in and recreate all of those, which is fine, you can do that. But if you have the premium version and you have a Twitter post, there's a button on there that it automatically resizes it for Facebook and it does it like that for you. So that's one example of where premium is different from free. So just a quick little example. So here's the visual dissemination logo that I was talking about before. And I am not a graphic designer. I have no training in graphic design. This shows you how easy it is for people, even with no training, to be able to do some of this work. And so here's an example um, that I created for this presentation. And I'm gonna show you. So this was already created. You can copy the page um, or actually that's not what I Let's do this. Let's oops, add a new page. So it's blank. And so it is so easy to create something like that. So if you see, there's the circle there, right? So you just go to elements and there's a circle and I click on that and it drops it right in there and I can size it how I want it. You can change the color here any way you want. Um, if I want to add, so there was a computer, right? So I just type in computer and it pulls up all of these different versions. Now, here's another example of if it says pro, you need to have the premium subscription for that, but there are versions like this one's free. So I could use that one for free and it, and it just depends on what's available, um, the different um, subscriptions. So I used, I used this, you can add text and it has different formats. You can add photos and you can have different drop different photos in there. there. You can actually even create videos and, and add audio now. There's all different sorts of things you can do with it. 
Um, so I definitely recommend it if you haven't done it before, super easy. I just wanted to show a couple other things. So one thing that's nice, you can also add your brand kits in. So we work with a number of different organizations and we have their branding kit right in there already. So it puts all the colors in. So it makes it super easy. The fonts, we uploaded logos. You can do all of the different things right in here and you don't have to add it every time, which is really nice. Um, and then, as I mentioned before, so these are some of our designs. There's just so many different things that you can create. Um, with this, with this resource, everything from infographics to slides for social media, Zoom backgrounds, um, slides with different um, images and different languages, and you can change it really quickly. So that is a super quick overview of Canva. Um, I'm happy to talk about that more later if we need to. Um, I also just wanted to show a couple other things. So this is auto draw. And so sometimes we like to use icons and auto draw is a resource you can use to do that. Now, if you are looking for an icon and you can't find it anywhere, auto draw is completely free and you can use it. And the great thing about it is, for example, if I want a bicycle, you can actually start drawing a bicycle and you get to see my awesome drawing skills here. So I can start drawing a bicycle. And if you can see up here, it starts to figure out, it says, do you mean? And it's trying to give me different options. So if I go a little farther, my awesome bicycle here. So this, obviously I don't wanna put this out in the real world, but if I click on this, boom, there's a bicycle and it's nice and easy. And you can change the colors and it's, it's really great. And then if you wanna start over, you just go back over here, say start over and you get a, you get a clean slate. So you can do something else if you want. So say, you know, we're talking about vaccines a lot. So if we wanna get a syringe, this is horrible, but you can, um, oh, it's so bad it doesn't even recognize the syringe, but there's <laughs> different options you can do here. So, um, oh, here we go, here's a syringe. So there you go, you can, that looks much better than mine, right? So you can do things like that. Um, if you wanna take it to the next step, um, so AutoJar is completely free. There are a few other resources that are available. Noun Project is one we like to use a lot. So Noun Project is free with attribution, which means if you use this, you have to put somewhere on your slide or somewhere in your social media that you, that you got it from here if you use it for free. Or you can pay, this one is $39.99 a year, but I'm gonna stick with my bicycle theme here just so you can see what some of the options are. So if you look for bicycle, you can see all of these, it comes up with all of these different options. And if you click on one, um, then you can see now I, I have a membership. So there's certain things you can do. Um, so no need to give attribution, but you can actually change the color of it too. So if you want it to be purple, you can do that. And then you can also download it in different sizes, which is really nice. Um, and then I also wanted to show, this is called Flat Icon, and it's just another version. So Noun Project had a certain look to it. If you want a different look, this one I like because as you can see, it has some more mixed colors and kind of more dimension almost to some of them. Um, so this one is, again, free with attribution, or this one's a little more expensive. It's $100 a year or $12 a month. So if we go stick with Bicycle, you can see um, it has some similar options before, but then if you come down here, you start to see it has some other ones with kind of more dimension to it. So it's just kind of what it is that you're looking for. Okay, I'm gonna go back to my presentation. And in the presentation, you'll see, I actually have screenshots of all of the, what I just showed. So you will be able to see that as well. Okay, so I just wanted to talk about videos a little bit because videos are really popular right now and also um, can um, add to what you're doing. So Vyond is one that we use. Now this one does have a cost. It's $2.99 to $9.99 a, year, $9 a year, depending on what platform or what um, subscription you wanna use. And it, it does have a little bit of a learning curve. So we do have somebody who, 
has a little more skill, but um, she was able to, to figure it out with, with a little bit of effort. Um, but we love it because the ATV graphic that you saw that was created with that, and I'm gonna show you some examples of some other ones. Um, Doodly or Toonly are also options. That, again, have a little bit of cost, but these are the whiteboard ones that you see where they're drawing on the whiteboard. Can be really nice if you have that uh, in your budget. If you don't have a budget, if you have a Mac or an iPhone, iMovie comes for free. And so you can learn how to use that to create videos as well. And you can do simple ones that have pictures that scroll in and you can do your own audio voice recordings um, up to some more advanced options. But that one is free and can be nice as well to create some short videos. So this is a quick example of some videos that we created. This one right here that you see moving was created with Vyond. It does not have sound because we have learned that a lot of people view our social media on their phones, maybe when they're standing in line in the bank or when they're maybe even watching TV with family members and they don't want the audio going. So we learned to create videos that have the text right in there and don't always have sound. So that's one example. This one was also created with Vyond, but we did wanna have a little extra with this one. So with this one, we added some sound. So I'm not gonna show the whole video, but hopefully you saw there was just um, a free audio track that went in the background. And then the nice thing about Vyond is it adds some motion. You can see the windmill turning, you can see the tractor going across. And that's really nice to catch attention on social media and things like that. And then this last one I wanted to show, this was created by the University of Michigan and it's on mental health and COVID. It also used Vion, but they used it in a slightly different way. Again, I'm not gonna show the whole thing, but enough to kind of give you a feel for um, their video here. The University of Michigan Injury Prevention Center acknowledges the challenges related to mental health and suicide prevention associated with the COVID-19 public health emergency. Stress and anxiety can look different in different people. Some common ways that COVID-19 related anxiety may manifest include, but are not limited to, excessive fear about your health and the health of others, changes in eating or sleeping patterns, difficulty concentrating, and more. Okay, so you can see just, they. I like that they have the, the voiceover. So if you need to have the sound and you have, you know, don't have access to some of the visual cues that you need, then you can have the sound because some people also just listen, um, but they also have visual aspects as well. So there's lots of options there. The University of Michigan Injury Prevention Center. Um, okay, so um, these are some ways to reach me. This might be one that you want to screenshot if you want to get to me before. Um, th these are posted and I'll leave this up for just a second. And I see some Q and A and chat is coming in. So I'm gonna go to the next screen here and we can start answering some of those questions. Yeah, um, Tracy, I'll, um, I'll share some of the questions um, for you. Um, I think you, let's see. Um, Let's see, um, just a second. Someone wants to know um, if uh, all Canva publications are easy to make. Oh, that's right. You're going to answer that later, ADA accessible. Yeah. Um, what about acronyms? You used like ATV in your, um, as an acronym in your um, examples. So are there any rules in something this short of when it's okay to use them and when it's not? So any yeah. like recommendations? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, so that we never used in isolation. We always had additional text that went with it that had it spelled out. So we use it only when either the population that we're addressing really knows what it is, or we have texts that go with it. So that would be in the body of the social media post, and then you add the, the visual. We always make sure to add that when we, when we can. So uh, we, in public health, at least, especially in injury, there are a lot of acronyms. So we always try to at least once spell out what it is. Great question. That's great. And um, while we're doing the other questions, do you mind putting back the contact info slide just for another few minutes? And that, but we'll keep going with the questions while you do that. Sure. Um, 
So um, a bunch of a bunch of them for Canva. Um, you know, we talked about the premium account. Um, what is the copyright around using Canva images outside of Canva? So this presentation was created in part using the Canva presentations. So it is actually using the Canva software. Um, in terms of using it fully outside, I, I'd want to double check. I think that you can do that, but I don't want to misspeak. So that might be one that I look into and make sure I'm um, answering it in the listserv afterwards. Okay, great, great. And then, so when you make an, uh, when you make something in Canva, someone was asking about the output format, like how editable is it um, from Canva? And then also when you do have designs with a free account, say, um, are they kept private on your account um, or do they allow other people to use those images that you've created? Um, so both fantastic questions. My understanding is that they keep it private. It is your account and what you put on there is yours unless you choose to share it. Um, in terms of how editable they are outside, not so much. <laughs> so um, it depends on which one it is and which format you download it into. But once you download it from Canva, sometimes it can be hard to edit it in other software. So that can be um, that can be a difficulty. It, each each piece is a little different. Like um, when I the, did the Canva presentation, and then you down you can download it as a PowerPoint. So you can edit it in there, but certain pieces can be edited like the text and the title, but sometimes the background cannot. So that is definitely something you wanna play with a little bit and get to know. But when you download, they often have lots of different options. So you can download it as a PNG or a JPEG, or they have actually have a print service that you can send it directly to print. There's uh, lots of different options of things you can do with Canva, but there are some limitations certainly. Right. And, you know, I use Canva a lot, too, and my experience in terms of it being editable, you still have all of your original designs on your Canva account. So if you need to edit something, you just have to go back to where it is on your Canva account and you can edit it there. Yeah. Um, OK, thank you. Um, and you can add photos into the Canva system, right? Your own uploads. Yes, and thank you for, I, for asking that. I meant to show that. So there is a, an upload option. And so you can upload your own logos, photos, anything like that, and they are accessible through your account. Absolutely. Great. Um, so let's see, um, how do you give attribution? You talked about some sites where you can use the, the, the visuals with attribution. So a great example is on the bottom of this page right here. <laughs> so I added icons on this page were made by flat icon. So that's what it would look like. It just has to be on your page or your image somewhere. Um, when you're creating images for social media, sometimes that can seem really big. So that's if you have a budget to buy the membership, so you don't have to do that. It's great, um, but it's easy to put it in there and put it on the bottom. Great, great. Um, let's see. Uh, someone was um, saying they coordinate Black-centric maternal child health education programs, and it's hard to find appropriate images. Um, so they're looking for uh, resources with diverse images of people. And someone else shared something um, after that, blackillustrations.com. But maybe, Tracy, you know of some other ideas? So <laughs> this is one of my personal missions to try and make sure that we get more diversity of all kinds. It's not out there very well right now. Um, I did on the photo page add another resource that I found recently. It's a site called Nappy, N A P P Y dot C O, and it has a fantastic array of Black uh, people of all doing all different settings and all different kinds of things. Um, so that's a great new resource that I found. It is absolutely something we need to do a better job of, though, for sure. Great. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, let's see. I'm trying to see what else was here. Um, is it, yeah. Can you explain um, how you create the text slides and animations on the videos? And they're wondering how difficult is it to animate in Vyond? Um, so Vyond is a little, it takes a little bit more once you do it a little bit though, um, they, they have some great resources to teach you and it does it by frame. So you have to do it almost like frame by frame. 
Um, once you've done it a couple of times, it's actually not that hard. It, it just takes a little bit more. You can actually also create videos in Canva, mm -hmm. um, which here, maybe I can, um, let me go back into Canva. Oops, did I close it? I guess I closed it. Okay. So, um, let's see, let's create a video. Um, so the, the way you would do it, so um, this will be a good example. Let's see. Oh, it doesn't do it here. Okay. Um, oh, here, uploads. So these are some different <laughs> uploads that we've created for various things. Uh, we have some magnet stuff coming out. So um, you can just slide it over there. Um, and then you add another picture. So if you wanna add some text, you just go into the text and you can pick an, one of these fancy ones or you can just put add a heading and you can put your own text right in there. It's that easy. And then when you download video, it turns it into, it'll cycle through those two images. That's, and you can see that it'll run for 10 seconds there. Um, you can add audio, like if I wanted to put audio in here, I can pick these sounds. Now this again, there are a lot more options for pro than free, but there are free options, but you literally could just add something in here. And then when it plays the video, very dramatic for magnets, but <laughs> um, it, it, it literally is that fast. Um, so uh, this is not gonna be a great example, but you can see here. And voila, we have a video. <laughs> That's great. You answered the question by actually doing it and showing how easy it is. <laughs> um, someone wanted to know um, about how, when you tried to get the nonprofit premium account, they have tried but never heard back and was wondering if you had submitted anything special or follow up with a specific email or number in order to get that nonprofit premium account. You know, it's been a while since we've done that. So um, I'll have to look into that. I know we had to submit paperwork with our EIN number proving that we were a nonprofit, um, but I, I will look into exactly how we did that. There was information on the website, um, but we may have had to call as well, but I can certainly look into that. Okay, great, great. Um, let's see, what about um, creating alt text for infographics made in Canva? Um, so, that is where sometimes I've had to drop it into PowerPoint. PowerPoint is fantastic with alt text. Canva isn't doing that quite as well yet. Um, so we, you have to kind of work around that. I, I'm guessing that's headed soon, but I don't think they do that very well just quite yet. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, great. Um, do you know anything about um, Adobe Spark or, and how that compares with Canva? Um, so only a little bit. Um, Adobe Spark is great if you have the Adobe package. That can be really expensive for a, for a lot of people for that Adobe package, unless you have the educational license, um, which you can get for either free or low cost, which is great. We haven't used it a lot, but I know people like that as well. Um, the nice thing about Adobe Spark is it does have all of the Adobe stock images or at least some of them available with that too. So if you have access to that, that can be a great resource as well. Okay, great, great. And someone someone put in the chat that um, their understanding is that Canva's are essentially photos. So the text won't be readable. So unless, I guess, unless you put it in the alt text specifically, so. Right, yeah, you do have to go in to do that for sure. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, 
People have uh, have put in a lot of good uh, suggestions for places to get photos and images, and we'll share that on the health literacy discussion list, that whole list later, in case you don't have to scramble and copy them, um, as well as any questions that we didn't get answered. We will, we will post them um, in the health literacy discussion list, which you can get to from the Health Literacy um, Solutions Center. Um, I'll put the link in. Um, let's see what else um, we have. Uh, Copy uh, the resources from the University of Michigan that you showed. Are they available uh, available without copyright, and do they have images to use? Um, so I don't think they have images to use, but they have you well. So you can use what I used in terms of for educational purposes, but you couldn't use like that copyright chart without contacting them to make sure that you're allowed to use it. Um, but they have access to all of that stuff on those web, on their website, they have a lot of great information. So I would definitely encourage you to go there. Great, great. Um, let's see. Um, do, do, do you generally find Canva easy to use as you know, for someone who's new to this? I literally had zero graphic design and I've had people compliment me on how great my images look. So I, I, you know, you just get in there and play around with it, but they make it so easy for sure. I, I definitely, it has changed what we are able to do. Um, I'm fortunate right now that I have a staff member that has some skills in that, but I don't usually have that. And it makes us look like we have a graphic designer on staff. That's excellent. That's yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Um, <laughs> You saw my great bicycle drawing skills. That's where I'm at. <laughs> <laughs> and we see the professional things that you put out as examples. So yeah, that's that's definitely a good selling point. <laughs> um, let's see. Um, okay, I think um, I think we have all of the questions um, answered. Um, let me see. I'm just checking. Yeah, I think I think that's it. Um, is there anything else you'd like to add before we wrap up and just sort of announce the next session? Yeah, so I love to hear from people if you guys have resources or you want to talk about challenges that you're running into, definitely contact me. Very passionate about this field. Um, I, I love the, the concept of using visuals to broaden who we're talking to and changing social norms and making our work more accessible. And if you know people have tips on that or resources to share with each other, I'd love to hear from you. I'd love to learn about that on the listserv and have conversations. Hopefully this was helpful to all of you. Thank you for bearing through my live demonstration. It can always be scary, but hopefully it was helpful. And thanks for spending an hour with me today. That's great. Well, thank you. Um, yeah, any questions? Yeah, someone was asking about get, where to get medical images, um, and we will we will put that out on the list if anyone has any quick quick suggestions to to put them in. But um, we will make sure to get that answered on the list. Um, so um, thank you so much, uh, Tracy, for um, for sharing this with us. The examples were great. Um, and just to remind everybody, um, these slides will be available on the IHA conference webpage um, by May 19th. So this will be available. Uh, you'll be able to get the slides and the recording. Uh, keep an eye on the discussion list uh, for um, for you know more answers to or or any follow up to this um, to this this presentation, and I think um, Tracy, can you go to the last couple slides? Sure can. Yes. Great. Okay. So um, yeah, here is the uh, here is the um, email to use or the the website to use hlc.ihaforhealth.org to learn more about the conference. Um, our next pre-conference se session is scheduled for May 5th at 9 a.m. Uh, Pacific time, which would be 12 noon Eastern time or somewhere in between. And um, it's about multi-level health literacy assessment for families with young children with complex needs. Um, Lindsay Rosenfield and Jonathan Litt. So we'll look forward to that. 
And um, again, I just want to thank you so much, um, Tracy, for sharing this, this great information with us today. And thank you, everybody, um, for coming and attending this webinar. We hope to see you again at, um, at the next ones. Take care, everyone.